there's a wide, wide world of geometry nodes. It's such a big world, it sometimes feels impossible to navigate. In this video, I want to explore the things that all nodes have in common, the fundamental geometry node concepts, and show you how I've come to understand them. So, I'm going to start simple, at the very beginning, with a single dot. If I wanted this dot to exist in 3D, I'd give it XYZ coordinates, and then it would hang there like a frozen ping pong ball in the vastness of virtual space. We can see this positional data in the spreadsheet. Now I know what you're thinking. A spreadsheet. I'm here for the thrilling possibilities of procedural geometry, not an email from my accountant. But the spreadsheet is fundamental for thinking like geometry nodes because it allows us to inspect our geometry. For example, here's the vertex, and here is its XYZ coordinates. This is an attribute defining the point in space our vertex is. It's the position attribute, and it's the only attribute our vertex currently has. If I open the geometry node editor, I can add a geometry node modifier to our vertex. Our geometry travels along this green noodle from the group input node to the group output. Selecting a set position node from the add menu, I can pass the noodle through it in a way that I'm going to animate here for speed and clarity. Now, if I change the offset values, it changes the vertex's position. What's happening in the privacy of this little node box is the position attribute is being set or offset with the values. Other than creating or removing geometry, this is what geometry nodes do. They do things to attributes. The different types of geometry use different attributes, with position being just the tip of the attribute iceberg. For example, if we convert our single vertex into the single control point of a curve, it would, as it does here, still look exactly the same. But inspecting it with the spreadsheet shows that the simplicity of vertex life is something this sophisticated curve could only dream of. So, with all this difference, let's look at four characteristics that all attributes have in common. There's data type, domain, name, and value. Making our own attribute seems like it would be a very good way to explore these characteristics, and we can do that with the store named attribute node. If you're wondering why it's not just called the store attribute node, it's because not all attributes are named. Some are anonymous, but in respect for their anonymity, I'm not going to mention them again until later. First, I'm going to set the data type. There are 10 that attributes can store, from the comforting vanilla of a float value to the powerful complexity of a 4x4 matrix, which is not, as I first hoped, Keanu in an SUV. Each data type has its own color, but not flavor, which is something I recommend you resist confirming. I'm basic, so I've selected float. Next, there is the domain, which is the type of geometry element that the attribute is connected to. I'm storing this attribute on our vertex, so I'm going to select point. Vertices of a mesh, points of a point cloud, and curve control points are all in the point domain. Then I'm giving it a name so it knows who it is and assigning a value. And now there it sits on our geometry. Some may argue in the comments section that store named attribute is an advanced geometry node, but then those same some would probably argue about anything. This node doesn't just help us understand the anatomy of an attribute. I'm going to use it to explain the next thing, and the next thing is going to be fields. There's only so much you can make with a single vertex. So how do geometry nodes handle more complex geometry? Now I have seven vertices. In the spreadsheet, there's seven rows, one for each vertex, each with its own position attribute. The rows are numbered, starting from zero. These are the index of each vertex, their unique numerical addresses, and the fact that they start at zero will be the most likely cause of you saying, oh, that's why it doesn't work. I'm going to store a named attribute on our geometry called Luke. And for its value input, use an integer with the value of 4. 
Now, all of our vertices have an integer attribute named Luke with a value of 4. The store named attribute node will always receive a single value from the integer node and store it on all of the vertices. If I replace it with an index node, however, the values of the Luke attribute are no longer identical. In fact, the store named attribute node is now storing on each vertex its index. But the index node has no input. Where is it getting these numbers to send? Well, it's not. You see the dashed line of this noodle. It is dashed to show that what it's carrying is a field. A set of instructions. In this case, the instructions are to use, for each vertex, its index. This node is whispering down the noodle to every element in the domain selected on this node. You don't need a value from me. The value you need is within you. I'm just here to tell you to use it. Use the index, Luke. If we look back at our previous input, the integer, with its solid noodle, and compare it alongside our index input, we can see that the integer has a circular socket while the index has a diamond. Circle sockets require single values, while diamonds can handle both fields or single values. A diamond with a dot in it is a field socket that's currently in a committed relationship with just one value. The power of these fields of mass instruction is that their directions can be expanded or elaborated on. For example, if I add a value to the field, say 40, the stored result for each vertex is now its index plus 40. Because now the instruction is, use the index and add 40. If I use a compare node, I can test if the index field is equal to zero. Again, I'm going to store the result, but this time as a boolean. And again, this noodle, now boolean pink, carries a set of instructions asking each vertex, is your index equal to zero? Or one, two, three, four, five, six. Does your index equal four? Is it less than four? Is it greater than four? And again, these instructions are carried out on the geometry. The questions being asked at the destination, whether it's seven vertices or seven million, because the answer is completely dependent on the context on which it is asked. In other words, the geometry on which it is being evaluated. This context is called the field context. The index node is a field input node, and there's a fair few of them. There are those for specific attributes, but we also have them for geometry information or calculations based on geometry information, attributes or both. The edge vertices node, for example, when evaluated on an edge, gives the index and the position vector of the two vertices that define it. While the curve tangent node outputs the direction a curve points in at each control point which is the kind of complex mathematics that even Oppenheimer would lose sleep over. Now I'm grabbing the position input node because we're going to use it to climb the last mini mountain of field understanding. Here we are back at our seven vertices. If I add a set position node and plug our position input node into it, into its position input, nothing happens. This is because the instructions being evaluated at each vertex are to set the position of each vertex with the position of each vertex. This is an evaluate at index node, which modifies the instructions of a field by controlling which index the data is retrieved from, placing all the vertices at the position of the given index. At this point, you might feel tempted to let your brain fall out of your nose. But wait, if I plug in an index node, the moment of clarity arrives. Because the index node's instruction of use the index means that the evaluate at index node is now retrieving the data from the position field using the index. In other words, this is the same as this. And if we multiply the instruction by 0.5, the evaluate at index node now retrieves data from the position field with the modified index using the position with an index that's half of its own. So given the importance of field context, the question is, 
how do we transfer attributes from one object to another? In this example, I'm going to take the positions of our seven vertices and use them to set the positions of seven instances, which I'm adding with the Collection Info node, where I've selected Separate Children so that each object in the collection is a separate instance and they don't squabble. So now we have our seven vertices positioned in their neat line and our seven instances. In this case, positioned at the origin. We know that doing this won't copy the vertices positions over because in this context, the instructions from the position node are to set the instances positions with the positions of the instances. The field only knows what it is when it gets there. But I can sample the vertices positions with a sample index node, then noodle the result over to the instances set position. This index input works in exactly the same way as it does on the evaluate at index node. Here, sampling the position attribute at the index. But in this case, the solid noodle and the dotted diamonds tell us that the output isn't a field, but a single value. The set position node using that single vector for every instance. So just like before, if I add an index input node, it becomes a field of the vertices positions. As it says here, a vector field based on index. But in the field context of this field, which index is it based on? The index of the vertices or the index of the instances? If you just said out loud, sat there in front of your computer, television, phone or smart fridge, it's the indices of the instances, Harry, you'd be right. Because the field is evaluated on the instances. We can prove this by storing the index on the instances as a named attribute and using this named attribute as the index for the sample index node making sure it's stored on the instance domain, of course. Determining field context can sometimes feel daunting, but if you follow a field's flow and identify where it's being evaluated, it's not. Finally, I want to talk about those anonymous attributes I alluded to quite some time ago. To do that, I'm offsetting the positions of our instances with some noise. If I added another set position node, what would I plug in here to set the instances back to their positions before the noise? We know the position node won't work, but it will if we capture the position attribute before it's changed. We can do this with a capture attribute node, which stores it on the geometry but without a name, and provides us with a field socket to specifically access its instructions. Writing this video was a lot harder than I expected. Through doing it, I realized how the simplest of ideas can so easily come across as advanced gibberish. If you want to support this or future videos, my Patreon is so new I can animate all the top tier members. I posted a few early versions of this video over there and will be doing so again with the next. Come hang, bring burritos. I'm Harry Blends and I hope this helped.